Welcome to Primetime Conversations. Here's your host, James Tunstall. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Today, joined by a very special guest, a man with over 30 years in the acting career, a poet, a writer, and uh, most famously known as Mr. Cartwright, a.k.a. Jay's dad, but today we know him as Mr. David Scholl. David, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you, James. Thanks for inviting me on to your podcast. Uh, looking forward to um, seeing what you want to talk about. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I try to keep things, uh, I suppose as a wrestling term, babyface. I try to be a good guy in my interviews. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll be all fine. But, uh, yeah, you just mentioned off camera um, you're starting a uh, strict diet regime and uh, training. Uh, I'm familiar situation. I uh, weighed myself uh, just after Christmas. Because uh, my parents said to me, to James, this is the heaviest you've ever been. So I weighed myself and I was like 308 pounds. I'm like, whoa, what's happened? So uh, first week of dieting, I actually lost 19 pounds. <laughs> oh, my God. 19 pounds. Yeah, it's like I chopped off a limb. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you the secret. Your scales were right. <laughs> I, 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 I'll tell you what I've been doing. So uh, you might have heard of it. Uh, intermittent fasting. Yeah, we were just talking about that. Yeah, I'm yeah. Do, I'm doing the sixteen eight version of it. Sixteen eight. So I'm doing the eighteen six version. So uh, I've been eating first meal at twelve, second at three, last one at six, and uh, basically the uh, my first meal, I've, I've it was for the first few days it was chicken and brown rice and broccoli. I can't do broccoli. The smell of it, it makes me ill. <laughs> even if I'm not eating it, even if the broccoli's touched the chicken, I feel sick. <laughs> so um, I've changed it a little bit. So I've been eating chicken and uh, wholemeal pasta. And uh, it's been doing, it's been pretty good at the minute. Like cold pasta is actually nice. So um, yeah, it's been going good. But yeah, I've got another uh, 90 pounds left to go. Well, that's amazing. You've lost that amount of weight. I mean, extraordinary. Although they do say that the first bit of weight loss on intermittent fasting can be water retention. But yeah, that's true. I think, I think 19 pounds is probably more than water retention. I mean, I, I put on a lot of weight during the pandemic. Um, mm. I was very slim before lockdown. And uh, yeah. unfortunately, my marriage broke up uh, sort of just before the pandemic. So I went into right. lockdown sort of a single man and then i i just started eating pasta and rice because you know yeah. there's all that stuff that people were stockpiling it and yeah uh, and i got a bit worried so i started buying i mean i wasn't stockpiling it but i bought a couple of packets and stuff and then i just started eating stuff that i would never normally eat mm. and it took me i'd say about two months to put on all the weight and it's going to take me thus far a year and a half to get it off i mean it's yeah. unbelievable how quickly you can put it on and you know but it sounds like your experience on intermittent fasting is that it's coming off really quickly yeah uh, david i'll tell you a quick uh, a quick backstory on what happened so since getting married i've always kind of struggled with my weight not as heavy as what i am now but um i suppose you get contented you know, you're not trying to impress the girls at the nightclubs anymore, basically. You, you're settled, I suppose. Um, but I got myself with a personal trainer a couple of years ago, and I got in good shape. I was down to about 218. And what happened? I fell off some ladders, and I fractured my spine, my T12 and my spine. Mm -hmm. oh. I, yeah, fortunately, it was a stable fracture, so they said we don't need to operate on it. So I'm like, thank God, because I was scared I was going into a wheelchair. And basically... They said, right, no heavy lifting. So I couldn't go to the gym. So I got depressed. So I started eating. And then lockdown happened a few months after. And like you said, you just, because you're at home, you're just eating. And uh, yeah, you can put it on very, very quickly. And it takes forever to take off. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a real night. I was trying to Google and figure out how much in stone 300 pounds is. Do you know, do you know what that is in stone? Oh, wow. top of my head, 21, 22 in between. Wow. That's a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. 21.4. Yeah, 21. 
and then at your best you were 218 pounds which is 15 did you say 218 or 216 yeah i got about 218 216 a couple of years ago yeah so 216 is 15 stone four so when i was um at my best weight i was 14 stone exactly in fact i think i slightly dipped under 14 stone and i haven't mm. been that slim since i was in my 20s um so i didn't weigh myself during the pandemic because it's yeah. a, it's a psychological thing but my stomach was like much bigger and i had a treble chin and all of that and now it's slowly come off. And my doctor said to me today, my God, you look a lot better than when I saw you in the summer. And I said, wow. yeah, I've, I've lost a lot of weight. So I've got type 2 diabetes. And, um, and just before lockdown, when I was slim, it was all diet controlled. And now mm. because of the weight I put on, I mean, I reckon I put on about three stone. So yeah. I would guess that I was up to 17, maybe even higher than that. Well, let's just say for the sake of argument, I was 17 stone. And then that has a big knock-on effect on your HbA1c blood sugar, you know, mm. free monthly blood sugar tests that they do. Um, well, actually, in my case, they only do it yearly because I was so well controlled. So he said to me today, I've got a feeling that you're going to have to go on medication. But I'm thinking, no, 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 no. When I was, when I was slim, my blood sugars were, were almost normal. I mean, they were still ever so slightly high, but not enough to put me on medication. Um, so I'm trying to get back to that. Yeah, um, I'm trying to initially get down to 200. So that's about 13 and a half stone, I think, give or take. Um, that's my target to hit before the end of the year. But if I hit it a bit sooner, then I'd like to try and get down to 180, which um, would be amazing. But uh, yeah, don't get me wrong. I am missing sandwiches and uh, pastry. <laughs> so what what have you cut out? Carbs? Carbs mainly, like uh, bread. Uh, bread, pastry, um, pasties, steak slices, you name it. <laughs> so actually, 200 pounds is still 14.2 stone. Because I, right. I, think, I think I got down to 196, which is exactly 14 stone. So if you want to get down to 180, then that will be 12.8 12 stone eight that that would be a pretty good weight how tall are you james yeah well that's the thing david i'm not even tall i'm only five nine okay yeah so so 180 i think would would be a good target for you yeah it's uh but yeah it's a challenge i haven't been going to the gym just yet uh i'm gonna try and get this initial weight off these first few weeks but yeah then get myself back into the gym uh but i'm looking forward to it david you know i'll tell you what it was um we will eventually talk about your film career, but I, <laughs> this right. is great. But uh, no, my uh, parents came over for Christmas, uh, just before Christmas, and went out for a meal. And they got uh, one of the servers to take a photo of all of us. And I looked, I'm like, wow, I'm like twice the size of me, Dad. And uh, it really puts it in your head. So uh, you, you don't realize I've got that complex when I look in the mirror, but I'm not really that big. <laughs> yeah, I've got the same thing. In fact, my sister talks about that. It's sort yeah. of body dysmorphia in reverse, isn't it? That's right, yeah. Yeah, so, I, uh, I have the same thing. I look in the mirror and I go, wow, you're looking really good. And then what I do to stop kidding myself is stand in profile. Because yes. then, then you can't deny it. But I, I, the, the mirror in my wardrobe, in, in the bedroom, is actually one of those ones that's really flattering. So right. the, other, the other day, after I'd been doing a workout at the gym, I took my top off. And in my eyes, I was like really ripped. And then yeah. I came into the uh, living room and checked myself out in front of that mirror. And I still looked like I was carrying a bit of weight and I couldn't see the muscle definition. So it's a really strange thing. But I seem to have that body dysmorphia as well. But mm. the, the thing that I don't kid myself on is like in a situation like this now, where I'm looking at myself on camera, and I can yeah. see that there's no double chin anymore. So mm. that's making me feel really good. And I think the thing with weight loss is you've got to do as everything you can to motivate yourself. So, and by the way, I live right near a railway line. So you'll hear trains going back and forth. So if weighing yourself is actually going to have the effect of demotivating you, 
which I suspect it would for me, then I don't weigh myself. I'm going to weigh myself in about another month mm. uh, when I come to take my diabetes blood blood sugar readings. So it's all it's all a big psychological thing. And, um, you know, I got into the habit of ordering takeaways and snacking late at night. So I've stopped all of that. And the intermittent fasting is so amazing for yeah. stopping you snacking. I mean, I you know, I do have to white knuckle it still. I've been on this thing for about six weeks now, um, um, but I've only been doing the gym workouts for four weeks. But the intermittent fasting I've been doing for six weeks and still between 10 and 12, I'm pretty hungry most nights, you know. But I just, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll either have a coffee or uh, drink some water. If I'm really starving, I'll just go to bed. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the thing. It's, it's the evenings. That's the killer because yeah. I like before I start dieting, I can very easily have a couple of sandwiches, not one sandwich, a couple of sandwiches, and uh, like, oh, there's a pork pie in the fridge, I'll have that. Yeah, and it, you can do some serious uh, damage. Uh, is that something that happens when you're going for rows? Uh, while we stay on the subject, um, like having like a bit of weight on top of you, like, have you been in a situation where you went for a row and like what, you could do losing a bit of weight or putting on some weight? Uh, for an acting part, yeah. I mean, yeah. in summer, I was in EastEnders. And right. um, and I had, I thought I'd been working on my weight um, throughout the summer because I was training to uh, run a half marathon. And right. um, and this was about, I'm just trying to remember when I did, did EastEnders. I think I filmed it in about July. So it was well into my training. Um but I was still carrying quite a lot of weight around my midriff. And so on the day of filming, I had a photograph taken next to um, next to one of the other uh, actors in the thing. And I couldn't believe how big I still looked. And then yeah. a month later, I ran the Hackney Half Marathon. Um, so you can, and, and there were some people on that Half Marathon who were still carrying quite a lot of timber. So you yeah. can sort of kid yourself, you know, and yeah. go, oh, I'm doing all this training, you know, can eat what I want. But really, I found nutrition to be 90 percent of it, really, because yeah. I've i always exercised. I've always played football on Sundays. You know, when I was training for the marathon, I was running four times a week, um, you know, I'm running very, very long distances. But if you're not and of course, when you're running long distances, what happens is you get ravenous. So I've switched it up this time. I'm not doing long bouts of cardio. I'm doing high intensity training. So I'll do a high intensity workout three times a week and then I'll lift weights and it seems to be working. But of course, the main component of it is the fasting. Yeah, it is. Uh, we'll have to do a catch up in six months time and see yeah. uh, how we've slimmed down. <laughs> well, forget uh, six months. I've got, I'm now on week four and I'm this current, leg of the program is a 12 week leg um, right. I'm supposed to be shooting a, a movie uh towards the end of january they haven't finalized the date yet but it'll either be january or february and i'm a little bit concerned about that because the catering on set is always really good and they do lots of puddings and high carbohydrate fattening food so i'm gonna have yeah. to really be careful because even though i'm on the fasting I still am limiting my carbohydrates and I'm eating yeah. a lot of protein and a lot of healthy fat, you know, like avocados, almonds, you know, things like that. So even though I'm fasting, it's still the same equation. If you're not burning up uh, enough, you know, the amount of calories you're putting into your body and then some, you're not going to lose weight. No, you're not. Yeah, that movie, is that uh, 13 Cars or is it another movie? It is, yeah. How do you know that? I do my research. Uh, you've been doing your research, yeah. So I'm doing that film with um, the directors, a guy called Rob Woods, and the actors in it are Frank Carper and Michelle Collins, the main oh, actors. Yes. Yeah, you know, played Cindy in EastEnders. So I'm really looking forward to it. You know, I haven't really done an awful lot of acting work in the last year, so it'll be mm. nice to get my teeth into something substantial. Yeah, um, I mean... I, I, I say this with every interview. I try to avoid uh, speaking about COVID, but it's something you cannot avoid. But 
what's it been like for yourself and was you in the middle of shooting some stuff what had to get shut down because of covid exactly that yeah so just before covid i got offered four tv jobs so oh. i did um i did ghosts i did um uh britannia and i was uh, i also did something called Witchfinder, which uh, has got tim key in and also the girl from our country i forgot a date what's her name uh, oh. daisy may cooper she that's was her, yeah yeah and uh but i haven't seen that yet I, so i don't know if that's come out so i shot those three uh, no i shot two of those things i shot my episode of ghosts which was a substantial part i shot Witchfinder, and then i was just about to go on and shoot rebellion uh not rebellion britannia sorry and, yeah um rebellion is the punk rock festival i'm going to in august <laughs> and they shut down filming of britannia so i was like right. oh no and the other thing was i was offered a part in pennyworth but it clashed with ghosts so oh, well. i had four tv jobs on offer um and since covid it's been nowhere near as good as that i did actually go back and shoot britannia in september um mm. so that was good it was good to do that and then after that, all I did was one episode of Doctors and an episode, three episodes, was it three? Yeah, three episodes of EastEnders last year. Yeah. Um, that's all the TV work I've done. So from my point of view, COVID has massively affected it. You know, yeah. I haven't any theatre work because the theatres were closed down for ages. So it's been, it's not been good. But I, I have done a, um, a commercial and I did a voiceover just before Christmas which has basically saved my bacon, to be honest. Mm. Um, but it's not it's not been a great time. Uh, as I said to you uh, off air, you know, I went through a marriage breakup. I was also involved in some other relationships that, you know, kind of went crazily wrong. So it's been it's been a really tough time for me during lockdown. You know, mm. really tough time. My mental health has been affected. In fact, my yes. GP said to me today, he said, you look so much better than when I last saw you. Um, actually, in August, I wasn't too bad. But earlier on last year, I was not in a good headspace. You know, um, my father died as well in uh, 2020, just before the first lockdown. Uh, and then just before that, my brother-in-law had died the previous summer. So it's my family's been through the ringer. Yeah. Uh, you know, my sister's been in a terrible state of grief but she's um she's coming through it now and you know faring better but i don't say any of this was self-pity james you know the fact of the matter is i'm really happy to be alive and i don't yeah. mean that, i don't mean that melodramatically you know i've got serious lung problems i'm borderline copd um mm -hmm. but because i'm an actor i manage you know through breathing i know how to breathe from the diaphragm and it it improves my lung function but right. if i had a caught covid before i was vaccinated i yeah. would not have fancied my chances you know so and also i worked through the second lockdown i think it was the second one the one that was in november uh 2020 i think that's right yes yeah. so i worked through that one and then the third one i was also doing some teaching work where i was going in and teaching so even though i've been as careful as i can i have come into contact with other people mm. um, and i think i must be one of those people that's got really high immunity um i, I just have this feeling because even with omicron i've been you know i went to the comedy store on friday and it was wow. absolutely, it was absolutely rammed and i yeah. I have not stayed in, um, you know, when when it was possible to go out, um, and I haven't caught it. So I just consider myself extremely lucky. Yeah, uh, same situation, David. Like, fortunately, I haven't had COVID, and fingers crossed, touch wood, I don't. And you mentioned theatre, so uh, my, uh, my my real job, uh, I'm a builder, uh, but I do internal work, and I've. Uh, there's is a theater i actually do some stuff for and uh 2020 i was meant to rip out all the uh, the pews and uh redo them and stuff like that 
And because of COVID, they had to completely shut down. It's like, James, we can't do it this year. We have to postpone it. So, yeah. So it's a, it's fe- the first lockdown. <laughs> this is the common sense. I try not to get too political on my podcast. But um, the, so the government gave out the mandate, right? If you can't work from home, you can still go to work. I'm like, well, all right, fine. that's great for me because I can't work from home. Uh, unfortunately, all the building merchants were closed. So I was like, well, unless I'm planning on going to the beach to get a bucket of sand, I, you know, I think I'm stuck here. And you mentioned mental health and it, and it, it's something that doesn't get brought up for men mainly because um, men do suffer from mental health and lockdown really did affect a lot of men. And I've tried to raise ways awareness of it myself for people um so i can understand obviously you've gone through a lot of hard times these last few years but i can understand where you're coming from with the mental health aspect because it really does affect men and especially in lockdown because we're always out mainly well i think also traditionally um a lot of men don't like talking about this sort of stuff Uh, you know they always think i should be especially people in your game you know, mm. uh, I would imagine they'd be quite sort of stoic and, you know, unwilling to discuss their feelings and just sort of get on with it. You know, in my business, in in the arts, people are a bit more, you know, open minded and a bit more willing to talk about their emotions. I mean, as an actor, my trade is dealing with my emotional life, really. So in yeah. some ways, I've been very lucky that there's no stigma attached to it. And. Also, you know, I don't mind sharing. I've also um, been in Alcoholics Anonymous for many years. Um, I wouldn't normally out myself like this, but because we're we're talking about mental health in that particular organization, um, mm. there or fellowship, as we call it, there are a lot of strategies for dealing with um, with you know difficult times because when somebody who's got a drink problem goes into the program they're at their sort of rock bottom and a lot of people are often suicidal and all of that stuff so i've used a lot of the coping strategies in aa so for example keep it in the day um you know this too shall pass uh, have a plan for yourself do two things every day that you don't want to do so when I'm a, a really low ebb, the first thing I don't want to do is get out of bed. The second thing I don't want to do is go to the gym. So I make sure I do both of those things. I never sleep for more than eight hours. Having said that, last night I slept for nine hours. And I'm <laughs> traditionally a really bad sleeper. So mm-hmm. the fact that I'm sleeping better is a plus. And I think it's connected to the intermittent fasting. Have you yeah. found that your sleeping's better? I have. And I feel better as well like i feel like i want to go to sleep and when you wake up because normally when you wake up you still feel tired but i've noticed because i'm going to bed a little bit earlier when i'm waking up i feel better and i actually feel like i'm ready to wake up not not forcing myself to wake up but i actually feel like i'm ready to wake up if that yeah. makes sense well actually i've got the i've got the slightly opposite thing to that because normally in the past, I would only sleep for six, seven hours maximum and I would wake up and I'd be bang out of bed. Actually, what's what I'm finding is happening with the intermittent fasting is I'm sleeping much deeper. And so right. when I wake up, it is taking me a bit longer to come round. But when right. I do come round, I feel fantastic. Yes. I, mean, I mean, I've got lines of age, but I don't I don't have big, heavy bags under my eyes at the moment. Which, you know, when I was going through these these terrible, um, you know, uh, emotional situations that I I was in, I I wasn't sleeping, I had big heavy bags, I looked stressed, I didn't look healthy. I did this short film um, a little while ago called The Chippy, and I'm really skinny in the film, and I look really unhealthy. Mm. Um, But now, you know, I'm feeling healthy, I'm eating really well taking my vitamin D tablets. So I think what I'm trying to say is I think in order to combat these difficult times, you need a structure to your day. Now, I'm quite used to working from home because um, certainly since the pandemic and even before that, in the acting profession, we have these things called self-tapes. So instead of going into an audition room, you do a self-tape from home, you put yourself on camera, you get somebody to read with you, if you can't get someone in the room, you'd get them to do the other part on Zoom. 
So you can do the whole thing from home. And even before that, even when I went in for auditions and stuff, I still spent a lot of time on my own at home. And yeah. my, my ex-wife said to me, we're all now finding out what it's like to live the way that you've lived for many years. Yeah. And so for me, it wasn't that difficult to get my head around because I have a lot of downtime as, a, as an actor. I mean, I always do other things like teach and, you know, I mean, recently I've started to... Um, pursue other areas of um of business you know like trying to get into the cryptocurrency markets and stuff like that so i'm well, all I, so I, are I, you into I, that i tried so uh my pal said to me this was end of september beginning of october buy sheep coin buy sheep coin i i bought sheep coin i bought I, I didn't buy a lot i bought like 30 pounds worth i bought it and within a couple of weeks it shot up to like 90 quid and I'm like, this is the next Bitcoin. I'm going to be a millionaire. And since then, it's, it's back down to like it. it's back down to like thirty six quid. I'm going to keep it because you never know. <laughs> well, I've I've got one called Polkadot, which is um, I only bought that yesterday, and that's that's gone up by about twelve quid in a day. And then I had Ethereum, um, which I converted to something called MetaMask, and MetaMask is um, where all the NFTs are. And yeah. my nephew I only found this out at Christmas, but my nephew has got his own um, his own NFT project, and it's called the Hairs. Uh, so I I bought two of those. So he showed me how to, you know, uh, transfer money, put it onto Coinbase, and then and then transfer it onto MetaMask. So I've now got three different currencies. I've got this Polkadot, I've got Ethereum. And then I got a tiny little bit of Bitcoin when I joined. I think I've got about four pounds worth of Bitcoin. Um, so I'm I'm just trying to sort of pursue other areas while the acting's still a little bit up in the air because um, you know as an actor I don't really have a pension. Well, I got a tiny little pension through equity. I you know I'll probably never stop working. Actors tend not to retire no. unless, unless I get ill health, yep. which I'm. Yep trying to stave off you know yeah i've noticed you've done a few of the uh comic uh, like the conventions as well i think i might have actually, uh, actually saw you at mcon in nottingham a couple of years ago I think oh yeah. yeah 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 i think I, take, I think i took my then girlfriend with me uh, yeah, I, yeah i was taking me around there to see the power rangers <laughs> oh did did you say hello I don't know if I saw you. I think I, I think I saw you sign, but I don't think you was actually at your table. I don't know if you went off to the loo or something at the time, but um, we was there in Nottingham. So yeah, this was a couple of years ago. This is where, uh, yeah, this was then because me yeah. kids wanted to see the Power Rangers because the Power Rangers seem to be there every year and they've got like massive lines as well. <laughs> <laughs> I nearly never made it because I, I had this crazy relationship after my marriage broke up and um, and. Uh, this, I, I, looking back on it, this woman, well, she told me she was bipolar, but I also think there was some kind of personality disorder going on. This is what I mean about mental health. Um, so the bottom line was I didn't understand what I was dealing with. And so I was driving up on the M1 and she got really angry with me. And we had this massive argument in the car on the M1 and I swerved. Wow. you know, through arguing with her. And I nearly, like, you know, plowed into a lorry. And uh, and then I just said to her, look, for the rest of this journey, just stay cool. You know, let's not argue. And uh, and then I got to Nottingham. I was really fraught. So that yeah. next day, and then she sat by me. And then she suddenly, halfway through the day, she suddenly got up and stormed out. I was like, what the hell is going on there? So I rang her. I said, where are you? She went, you're ignoring me. <laughs> I said, I'm not ignoring you. I'm talking to people. I'm working. This yeah. is my work. So, you know, there was a lot of kind of stressful situations like that, which dated right back to that to that Comic-Con um, thing. But I also, I did one recently at Liverpool, which was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and all the in-betweeners guys were there the day before me um and uh and i've done quite a few i've did reading st albans um and a few others stoke i did um so yeah it's been they've been really good you know i i've sort of 
uh, I sort of resisted it to start with. And then people mm. kept asking me and saying, and I, you know, because I always thought they were just sci fi conventions. And yeah. people said, no, you know, if you're, if you're, you've got a fan base, which the in between is clearly has, you yeah. know, people are going to want to see you. So, yeah, I've done, I've done quite a few of them now and I really enjoy, I really enjoy doing them. I met all the guys from Sons of Anarchy. I met, um, I met the guy who played Boise, um, John Chalice, just before he died. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he was at the St. Albans one. So I was, I was really happy that I got to talk to him before he died. Um, so, you know, I meet some lovely people at them as well. Yeah, they are great. And like what you said, and I've heard interviews from, uh, I listen to quite a few podcasts and I've heard people who now does the conventions and similar situation. They said that try to not go to them because we didn't know what it was like, but they said now we love them because we love interacting with the fans and, we have such a good time, not just meeting the fans, but meeting these other stars from other shows. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're really great. You know, and all the actors there are really, you know, easy to get on with. And I had a really long chat with one of the guys from Sons of Anarchy. Um, mm. You know, it was just, it was really lovely to, and we were talking about acting. I was talking wow. about acting technique, and he was telling me, um, you know, of how he got into acting. And it was really quite, you know, very different stories you know growing up in LA for him and me growing up in uh, in London very very different worlds but similar sort of experiences as well you know I do love talking to other actors I think you know especially ones from America and other countries because they have such a in some ways they have a very different experience to me but in other ways we're very similar as well you know the sort of obsession of getting into acting and the the struggle to get into it is always quite similar, you know. Yeah, which uh, I don't know if you know his name. I'm a big Sons of Anarchy fan, um, so I'm going to hazard a guess which one was. Uh, what did he look like? I know they've all got beards. So he's a really big guy with a huge belly and a oh, big, Bobby a Elvis. big bushy beard. Bobby Elvis. Uh, he's been in a few films, actually. Yeah, uh, what's, what's his name? His name? Uh, his character name is Bobby Elvis. Yeah, that's him. That's yeah. Uh, right. He's what's his real name? I I'm going to Google it. Mar I, Mar I think Mark something. I think yeah, it's Mark. You're right. So I'll put Bobby Elvis from Sons of uh, Bobby Elvis actor, and yeah, Bobby Munson. Uh, Mark Boone. Mark. Boone. That's right. That's right. <laughs> now the really funny thing was. I thought he was Ron Perlman. Don't ask yeah. me why. He, he looks a bit similar to him, but of course, Ron Perlman's got a much, you know, smaller beard. Um, yeah. But for about half an hour, I was thinking he was Ron Perlman, and then he got up and walked. And he had he's he's got injuries to his knees because he was yeah. telling me that he played soccer in the MLS. I think he was a goalkeeper. Oh, wow. Sorry, yeah, so he, he played at a really good level. It was before the MLS was big. And then, um, and then I went over to the person who's looking after me. I said, I've just been talking to, uh, to Ron Perlman all over lunch. He said, no, you haven't. You've been talking to Mark Boone. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, of course. And then he got me a signed photograph from Ron Perlman, which I was really pleased about. And then he sent me this photograph of all of them together. There's that guy, Kim Coates, as well. I'm gonna need, yeah. I'm gonna need my glasses on for this. Um, so yeah, so I've now I've also got a photo. What have I done with that? A photo of them all together, um, which I shall cherish. And I was really pleased that um, that he did that. You know, because Ron Perlman has been something of a hero of mine. You know, not just yeah. Vanicky, but he was in Hellboy, and you know, mm. he's just, he's done loads and loads of really good stuff, hasn't he? So. Yeah. I was really, I was really quite, look, that's my before picture. I don't know if you can see that. Right. <laughs> that's my before picture, uh, not so long ago. So when, at the end of this 12 weeks, I'm going to put an after picture. And if it's flattering, then I may well post it on Facebook. If it's not, then I probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the case. like, yeah, we'll leave it for another six weeks. So let's leave yeah. a bit more. <laughs> But uh, now uh, I love Sons of Anarchy. I'm opening. Oh, there it is. There's the photo. Can you see them all together? Yeah. 
So there's oh. so, so there's Mark there. There's Kim Coates, Ron Perlman, and um, the Irish guy. I forgot. That's the, right. Well, the, guy, oh. the streak down the side. Yeah. Um, now, great show. Uh, I recommend for everyone watching. I recommend it if you haven't watched it. Uh, great show. Um, you, you've mentioned the football and soccer a few times, uh, obviously, and I, I would imagine that's something that helps with you, uh, with, you know, mental health as well, or relief. But what football yeah. team do you support, David? Well, I'm a big West Ham supporter. I'm a season ticket holder. Oh, wow. uh, I've been for quite a few years now. Um, yeah, I'm going tomorrow night to watch us at home to Norwich. I went on Sunday uh, where we beat Leeds 2-0. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been a great couple of seasons. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, when we first uh, transferred to the London Stadium, uh, which was then the Olympic Stadium, the amount of moaning. I've never yeah. heard so much moaning. Uh, you know, West Ham fans are really good at moaning. And there was one game where we were losing 3-0 at home to Burnley. And, uh, you know, there was a pitch invasion and, you know, chance of, you know, real hostility towards you know, GSB, Gold, Sullivan and Brady. Uh, and then as soon as David Moyes came back for his second stint, it's just been upward, upward, upward. They've been playing really good football. Signing Jared Bowen was amazing. He's yeah. been, up, you know, him and Declan Rice have been our two best players, really. So, right. I'm, you know, I'm so happy that West Ham are winning more games than they're losing. Which yeah, is- you beat us. I'm a Liverpool fan, and you beat us this season. I know. We beat you. We beat Chelsea. You know, it's, um, and then we go and lose at home to Southampton. You know, it doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> West Ham. I think. Uh, I mean, at least Man United ain't winning. We can all agree on that. We're happy about that. <laughs> when, when we when we flogged them five nil, I was like, I'll never forget this day. <laughs> I'm not one of these people who hates other teams. Because my, my granddad was a big Tottenham supporter. But, right. you know, Tottenham are the arch enemy at West Ham. So you can never, you can never admit to uh, liking another... Well, I w- I'm not saying I like Tottenham. But I, c- I can never admit to not hating them. And it's yeah. the same for United, you know. I remember, excuse me for saying this, but in the 70s and 80s, the first division got boring because Liverpool won everything, you know. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> so when Man United suddenly came along and won the league. Well, actually, Leeds won it before then. Yeah, then, yeah. Do you remember that season Leeds won it? And then Cantona transferred to United and then United won it. And I, I was quite in awe of that team, mainly because of Cantona, actually. He was yeah. such an enigmatic player. And then they and then Man United got boring. I was sick of them. And then Arsenal won it a few times and... Uh, you know, and I, I quite liked Wenger. And then Man City came along. So I was like, oh, good, a new team. Now I'm bored with Man City. So I'm at the point now. Oh, and then Leicester won it, which was unbelievable. Yeah. So, and I thought maybe West Ham might might become one of those teams. But it's not it's not looking like it just yet. No, I was born in uh, 89. So last time before a couple of years ago, Liverpool won the league was 90. Uh, so growing up, I've known nothing but Man United winning the league, and it, like people calls me a glo- like I've supported Liverpool since I've been free uh, to yeah. my imagination. People calls me a glory support. I'm like, are you being serious? The nineties were pretty bad for Liverpool, even though we're a big team. Yeah, uh, but the last few years under Klopp, it's been amazing. Like, um, I this is like the best time in the world to be a Liverpool fan. I like this season we're doing good, but. City's just got so much money to spend and to keep up with them. Like, I remember seasons where teams could win the league with 80 points or 80 odd points. Yeah. Now you have to be perfect to win the league. You have to get 95, 96 points to win. Liverpool Liverpool had 96 points and we finished second. (laughs) How how can you explain that? That's nuts. You know, you can own. I mean, in I think the maximum amount of points you can is it 113 or something like that. So think, yeah. hang on, let's work it. So it's 38 times three. Yeah, 114 points. Yeah, that's the maximum. And City are getting over 100 points. I mean, that's that's just ludicrous. You mm. know, that's such strength in depth. 
I mean, probably their their second string team would win the league, or at least yeah. be in the running. So yeah. they've got so much strength in depth. That's the thing. I think it's pretty funny that's hap- what's happening with uh, Newcastle because they're the richest team in the world and they're struck. You got knocked out by Cambridge United in the FA Cup. No, no. And, yeah. I, I, I'm, and I'm not saying this to be evil. I would love it for them to get relegated because they're the richest team in the world. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what, though? I don't think they're going to. Because they're, no. they're, they're signing Chris Woods. Not not that he's the greatest player, but he'll be an interim. Uh, he'll be an interim gap, you know. And um, what's his name? The the right back. Oh, Trippier this time. Yeah, yeah, Trippier. He's, you know, he's a great signing. All they've got to do is make, you know, two or three other signings and they'll they'll have enough to stay up. So I don't I don't think that they'll go down. I mean, it would it would be hilarious if they did, particularly as the uh, the human rights record of their new owners is not so good. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> but then, you know, Man City were owned by uh, the Thai people, weren't they, before? Oh, uh, man. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. So, you know, and Abramovich, where did his money come from? So I think all of the, you know, there's not a billionaire in the world who hasn't done something dodgy. Oh, otherwise, no. you don't, otherwise, you don't get to be a billionaire. But yeah. when your club's backed by, you know, the Saudi Arabia country, uh, as Newcastle basically are. Is it Saudi or no? Where, where are their owners from? Um, Abu, Abu Dhabi. Uh, yeah, yeah. Small. I yeah. get mixed up. Uh, but... I mean, once that this is the thing now, because end of the day, money does help a football team. We've seen what it does with Man City. Um, eventually, Newcastle will get to the point eventually where they will just dominate. So we're just trying. Hopefully, Liverpool wins a league title before that. But it's it's hard. Uh, I've waited thirty years to win the for Liverpool to win the league, and when it finally happened, there was yeah. no fans in attendance. I thought typical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it's. Uh... But but you know what I mean? It's it's the best Liverpool team I've seen since yeah you know since um, Bob Paisley's era really. Mm. Um, I mean I I still remember that amazing Champions League match you know against AC Milan. Oh yeah, you remember seeing that? Yeah, um, well, for the longest time that was my biggest highlight as a Liverpool fan, and uh, that in 2001 was a good season for us. Um, but yeah, uh, it was them two, and uh, yeah, two, uh, yeah, uh, and also the FA Cup against your lot. Don't talk final. about that, <laughs> Lionel, Lionel Scaloni. Instead of clearing the ball into Rose Ed, he passes it right straight to Gerard, who banged yeah. one in, and then, uh, and then the rest is history. It was amazing. Uh, it, this was straight after. This was the year after Istanbul, and uh, another free, uh, free free draw penalties, but. Gerard, what well, just out of nowhere, he hits it and uh, what a goal. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sorry as well. <laughs> yeah, it was an amazing game. Yeah, it was. Um, but I, I suppose we'll talk a bit, bit about your acting career, but um, something we mentioned off camera. So uh, that wrestling shot, so I watched it today actually and I was entertained. So is some, wrestling something you've watched growing up, like World of Sport and such? Yeah, yeah. My granddad used to, you know, the old deers in the crowd with the brollies going up to Mick McManus and Jackie Palo. I mean, I I remember all of those um, all of those uh, wrestlers and the guy, Kendo Nagasaki, the guy who wore the mask. And uh, was it Roller, Rollerball or whatever his name okay. was? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, rem- I mean, a, a lot of them were in that film, you mm. know. It was extraordinary. It's a guy called Ben Gregor who directed that. And, right. um, and he recently called me in to work with me on Britannia. So, you know, sometimes it pays to work with these guys when they're up and coming. And if you're lucky, they'll still remember you. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised something like that hasn't been picked up for a natural series because um, World of, obviously World of Sport was before my time, but obviously I've gone back and watched all of it. But it was so big in the UK. Uh, it was watched by millions every week. I'm surprised. I know they've done some documentaries, but I'm surprised there hasn't been that type of series, like people playing them and having like a little series about it. I think the thing is that we live in a very different climate these days, particularly in my profession. So a lot of the projects that are being commissioned now uh, need to have really strong female characters in. So I right. think I think the time for 
you know, a show about a bunch of old wrestlers has probably been and gone. You know, yeah. if it was going to happen, it would have happened. You know, I think it was back in the nineties when we when we filmed that, or maybe the noughties. I can't remember. Um, but I think these days, uh, everything is about you know having strong female characters and also diversity. So mm. it might be that these old, um, these old sort of nostalgia pieces like that are a thing of the past because moving forward on, on the back of the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter. Um, Black, what is it? Black Lives Matter. Yeah, I got that yeah. right. No, sorry, um, <laughs> my, my mind was playing tricks on me then. Um, but um, but I just think that you know we live in a very different world uh, to when to when we did that. You know, um, so it's it's really the the projects that are going to get commissioned now have to have really strong female characters. And, yeah. um, and preferably, you know, be quite diverse in nature because that, that's the way the industry has moved, you know, to re reflect the society that we live in. Um, okay. You know, and it's, I mean, for me, really, it doesn't change an awful lot because I've always done comedy. And, um, and while the comedies I've been involved in, like The Office and, and The Inbetweeners, haven't exactly been massively diverse. Um, mm. They all have had strong female characters. And I yeah. think Ricky Gervais writes well for women, you know, um, like Afterlife, you know, there are some great characters, even though he's always going to sort of be the lead of his own stuff. Uh, yeah. You know, in um, in Extras, you know, you had Maggie. Um, in The Office, you had... Um, what was her name, who ran the office, Sterling Gallagher's character. Uh, oh, I know you mean, yeah. Uh, it Jenny it? or something like that? Jenny, um, something like that. Yeah, sorry, office fans, my memory's not so good. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so so I think I think of, uh, of a TV series about a bunch of old wrestlers from the 70s would be a bit of an anachronism now. You know, it'd be, yeah. sort of, be a bit outdated, I think. Uh, so, yeah, speaking of the office, uh, how is Ricky Gervais to work with? Obviously, he's had a big, massive career now in Hollywood, and uh, his speech at the Golden Globes was classic. I actually loved everything <laughs> about it. Um, yeah. how, was he, how was he to work with? Well, pretty pretty much as you see him. He was funny. He was childish. He was, you know, I didn't really know him that well. And um, when I when I did the first couple of scenes in the office, um, in the warehouse, rather, I, I sort of, you know, I didn't know what was going on, really, because I didn't understand, you know, what the style of it was. Um, it sort of took me a while to to warm up to it. And then when I came back and started doing season two, it had been a massive hit. So I yeah. realized that I was involved in something extraordinary. And then by the time we did um, the Christmas specials, I was almost in awe of him, you know. So I didn't really, um, I didn't really get to know him fantastically well, because I wasn't really in it enough, you know. Uh, yeah. But he did say to me that the beans and muff line was going to be uh, a legendary line. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, I was watching the one with the girl uh, when she's pregnant, and that, and, like, yeah. that just that just stole the episode. <laughs> that. Uh, uh, that actress is called Elizabeth, Elizabeth Barrington, and she's amazing. She's yeah. a stunning actress. I love her. I've seen her in lots of other things. Um, but she she really made that. <laughs> she was just like, when you said your lines, it was what she was just heartbroken. I was like, <laughs> yeah. oh. And I and I never liked it to that point because I always wanted uh, Martin to end up with the other girl, the receptionist. I, I'm bad for remembering character names. Sure. Uh, that dawn, so uh, so I always wanted them to end up, but at one point he was with her. So when she, uh, you said that to her, I was like, I actually feel sorry for her now. <laughs> well, it cuts to them and they go beans muff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was funny. It was one of those zinger lines, just because yeah. you let some useless tosser blow his beans up your muff. <laughs> <laughs> and. As I'm watching it, and obviously a big, massive fan of the in I couldn't help but see Mr. Cartwright. So 
how we'll talk about the Imbatrainers. So how did that come about? You getting cast for the Imbatrainers? Well, I I suspect it was on the back of the office. Right. I, the thing is, what you got to understand about me is I was pretty oblivious in my thirties, in my twenties mm. and thirties. I didn't have a clue what was going on. I would audition, I would turn up, do the jobs, go home. Normally, I would be sort of complaining because. I didn't have a lead role in the stuff. I mean, I so I met Ricky Gervais at the audition and he'd had this weird chat show on. And right. one of his earliest guests was Michael Winner. And we were joking about Michael Winner because I'd done a film with Michael Winner. It was my first film out of drama school. I was oh, in wow. my late 20s. And I mean, I'd done a few bits and bobs of TV. And then suddenly I was on set with this absolute monster who shouted at me for, you know, three hours <laughs> doing my bit. And I was working with this, you know, phenomenal actress called Leah Williams, and he made her sort of dress in a bikini and all, or, or underwear, rather, in this awful exploitation film. Um, but uh, so years later, I met Ricky Gervais, and we sort of joked about Michael Winner. And I think I got the job on the back of that. Now, what I didn't realise is that Ricky was really good friends with Ian and Damon, the writers right. in between us. So I think uh, the the character I played in The Office sort of informed Terry Cartwright. And, yeah. And even though I sort of... I, th I think the character in, um, in The Office was a bit meaner, and I tried mm. to make Terry Cartwright a bit, you know, a bit funnier, but he was still... <laughs> Yeah. at his very core he's still doing damage to his son and then yeah. there's that scene where he's trying to talk to me about his girlfriend and i'm watching yeah. that scene. so i'm going all oh, right so you're back with a pig oh yeah yeah so anyway you know and it's like it's like imagine having a dad like that and so many lads come up to me and they go <laughs> my dad's exactly like that and i go yeah, you, yeah. Poor, you poor sod <laughs> but i sort of based it on one of my uncles not not that my uncle was me, but you know, he had this laugh after everything you did. He was like, ha, 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 how's it going? Yeah. Ha, ha, ha. So, you know, that thing where people laugh at their own jokes, I've, I've sort of known, I've had a few friends that have done that as well. So I just thought, I thought Cartwright was one of these people that just doesn't know when to stop taking the piss, you know, and he's, he, he loves his son, but he probably doesn't realise the damage he's doing to him. <laughs> yeah, well, Mr. Cartwright is, um, he, I think he ran a, a building firm, didn't he, on the show? Yeah, he did, yeah. And I, I mentioned to you, I'm a builder, so I was, so I went to uh, vocational college when I was 16, so you had to get an apprenticeship. So I've been on site as a 16-year-old, as a labourer. And I've seen that in the person like builders acting like that and taking the piss out of me. So I yeah. could actually relate to it when I'm watching it. Well, mate, I use my experience because I used to work as a plasterer's labourer when I was a kid. And right. uh, if you want to do a hard day's graft, do that. You used to knock it up in the bathtub. You know, it's, um, what do they call it? Excuse me one tick. I'm just now, I'm getting too hot now. <laughs> yeah, so that we knock up the... Uh, is it the floating in the bathtub and then the setting? Uh, so, yeah. You know, and I'm carrying these hundred weight bags of cement on my shoulder. I mean, I was strong as an ox then, but Jesus, I've never known hard work like it. Yeah. I mean, the builders really earn their money. So I, I've I've had the piss taken out of me left, right, and centre. You know, and yeah. I'm I'm quite robust really because of that. So I yeah. I just sort of based it all on. The, you know, that thing about it's meant to be work experience, not standing around being a useless twat experience. Yeah. <laughs> I've had that a lot. I've, I've, I've got on this one building site and this guy who was built like a brick shit house took an absolute dislike to me. It didn't matter right. what I did. You know, it was, I'd just come out of drama school and I, I sort of needed some extra money. And he shouted at me and all that. And then he went, what the fuck are you supposed to be? You're supposed to be like working. I was driving this dumper truck around. He went, you're supposed to be working. Get off that truck. And I said to him, you know what, mate? I said, I've had enough of you shouting at me. I'm, I'm going. I'm going back to London. He went, go on then, fuck off down the road. <laughs> so I'd, I left. And then I said to my parents, <laughs> who I was staying with at the time, 
I said, I'm not going back to get my money. I said, that guy's a twat. So I sent my parents around to get the money. Okay. They said he was as nice as pie to us. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's my experience of working on the building. Uh, they're, they're brutal building sites. They really are. People don't realise how bad they are. They are, especially as a labour apprentice. But, uh, but well, I think school was like that as well. I oh, mean, yes. complete piss taking all the way through. You know, mm. bullying. I'm, you know, you either you either be the bully or you get bullied. There's not. Yeah. There wasn't a lot in between in some of the schools I went to. So. You know, and I moved around a lot because my dad was American in the American Air Force. So I went to junior high in America and in Stevenage, where I grew up, I went to um, two senior schools. The second one has been closed down because it's so bad, you know, a place called Shepelbury. And there were some terrible bullies in that year. And because I was a new kid at the school, they all said that they were going to gang up against me. You know, they they told me on the Friday they were going to get me on the Monday. So I had the whole weekend to think about my entire class were going to beat me up. And luckily, I knew the hardest kid in the school who's the year above me. He was called Tiny. He was six foot six, built wow. like a brick shells. And he comes in the class, and the the main tormentor was this guy called Stephen Ball, B U W L, who everybody called Ball Brains. And he walked in the class. He went, Ball Brains, pal, come here. He went, you see him. He's he's a mate of my friend or something like that, or he's a he's the nephew of my mate or something. And then he went, "You touch him, you'll have me to deal with." And then he walked out, and that was it. I never got I never got touched again. <laughs> so, what what was uh, the American schools compared to the England? I bet the American schools was a piece of cake. Well, started off good but again the same thing you know you you're a bit more of a celebrity because you're coming from england and i started off playing really well you know in their in their soccer team uh, right. but i went to a school that only played rugby and cricket the Alain right. school i didn't they didn't play football when i went there but where shepelbury did so i was a bit out of practice when i went to america but i started off still being really good and then by you know the second term all the kids caught up with me um, and then I started getting bullied after that. It was horrible. And they're really like big kids out there as well. You know, they're about six foot six. You couldn't, you know, I, I wasn't that tall then. So you can't really have a round with them because they'll kick your head in. They're like, they're <laughs> like blokes. Uh, yeah. And again, I was very lucky again that one of my cousins who went to the school, a guy called Bobby McGuckin, um, he was the toughest kid and he just left the school. And they, a couple of people saw me walking around with him outside of school. And they said, how do you know Bobby McGuckin? I said, he's my cousin. And that was it. Never got touched yeah. again. So I've been, I've been very lucky that I've known some pertinent people. But I did, you know, I did have to have a few fights and oh, I yeah. all that. Because I'm not, I'm not aggressive or violent in any way. But um, yeah. in fact, the fight I had at the Shepelbury School was like the Wild West. There were desks turned over and everything. It was, it was just really bizarre, you know. So that was those were my school days. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's weird to me because I shot up to five nine at a really young age, but then since then I haven't grew. So for, <laughs> unfortunately, I was taller than a lot of the other kids, so they kind of left me alone. Uh, but get back to the trainers. I think my favorite episode you done was Caravan Club. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one like, everyone remembers. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was great. You know, again, I, I think the the one, the bit inside the caravan was my first day on it. So I didn't right. really know much about it. And I I didn't know who the kids were. And I sort of, you know, I got talking to them and got on with them all really well. And then, and then we did the toilet scene. But that was, I think, a couple of weeks later in a different location. It was freezing bloody cold. Uh, uh, oh god i i've never been so cold filming i remember that day really well and um you know we're sort of all scantily clad in the toilets um so but it was fun you know the kids were great uh i i won't i won't say what well, i will say uh one of the one of the writers said to me dave can you go and give them all acting lessons because they can't concentrate properly <laughs> <laughs> so um so yeah 
I, I didn't. I just, I just thought, so, no, I think they, I think they're good. I think he was kind of half joking, you know. Uh, yeah. But it was, it, it was funny, you know, uh, to, what, to watch them evolve from these young greenhorns into like these big stars, you know. Yeah, I think my favourite part of the toilet scene is when you're, you're giving Jay some stick, and he's all of a sudden he comes like, "Dad, will you leave it?" It's along the night. You're like. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and you've done the movies as well. Um so did you travel to Australia for the second movie? Yeah, I did. But do you know the weird thing was I was the only one of the parents who did. That's and, right, yeah. And I think it was a mistake. So I go to Australia, I turn up on set, and Ian uh says to me, uh, what are you doing here? And I said, what do you mean? What am I doing? I'm in. I'm in this scene. So he went. You're lucky. We forgot to cut you out. <laughs> so I was the only one of the parents who got to go to Australia, and it was by default. <laughs> and and I got paid quite a lot of money. The first film we got paid nothing, but the second yeah. film they paid us properly. So I think nice. I had about. I think I had two weeks on that, and they actually yeah. shot an alternative ending. Um, yeah. Which they didn't use. That had Marek Larwood on from We Are Clang, you know the the um, the duo that Greg Davis started out in. But um, but the great thing about Australia was I got to work with a really good actor called David Field, who Hi. you know him. Yeah, he's in that great movie Chopper. Um, I watched that. So there's a um, a YouTube series uh, called. Uh, criminal, uh, casual criminalist, and he actually done like the real life story about the guy. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, I can't yeah. believe this actually happened. <laughs> yeah, Mark, what was his last name? I can't remember his last name now, but complete yeah. lunatic, absolute lunatic. And who, who's the Australian comedy actor who played him? Who was it? Was it Eric Banner? Yeah, Eric Banner. He was a big yeah. star at the time. And, yeah, uh, and I just thought. Jesus, this guy's a really good actor. And David Field was the guy that he cuts up in the prison. So okay. he's, he, he puts boot polish on his head. <laughs> and he goes, mate, he goes, that ah, chopper, you just go around bashing people up, mate. And he goes, and then he goes up and stabs him in the throat and kills him. I mean, it was just like unbelievable. And I remember yeah. watching that film thinking, this is amazing cinema. So yeah. I, anyway, I got to hang out with David over in um, over in Australia, which was really good fun. He was a, he was a great guy to hang out with. Yeah. Uh, you were in attendance, wasn't you, for the in between in the betweeners reunion? Yeah, you know, mate. I'll show you something. Just bear with me. Not only was I in attendance, I got my one and only acting award. Oh well, that's right. Yeah, that's you remember? Great. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think Frank Bruno was on stage at the time. Greg, Greg Davis actually presented it to me. Um, mm. And he said, this is the only award, really, that's connected to any discernible talent. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, good. that was good fun. I enjoyed that. They told me I was going to get it beforehand. So they had this yeah. speech. What I noticed is they gave me this speech, um, you know, and asked me to say a couple of things. And then I said some other off-the-cuff things. And they cut out all the off the cuff things and uh, and just left in the speech that they had authorized. <laughs> and uh, I noticed you'd done the series Frontier with uh, Jason Momoa, and obviously yeah. he's been Acroman, Cal Drogo, and Game of Thrones and such. Uh, what's he like to be around? Don't know, never met him. The, yeah. the people that I was working with on that was Alan Armstrong, um, yeah. who, was, who was in uh, Get Carter. He's a very, very well-known English actor. And Zoe Boyle, I did some stuff with. And um, and a Canadian actor who was doing one of the worst Cockney accents you're ever going to hear in your life. I think his name was something like Ethan Jonakite. His last right. name, Jonakite or something like that. Um, so I never met the big man, Jason Momoa. Right. Um, but I had a great time over there. We filmed we filmed that in Newfoundland in um, or Newfoundland, however you want to pronounce it, over in Canada. And a lot of them had really strong Irish accents. And really? this is how I got the job. 
So I had an American agent and I'd been back and forth to America over a couple of years. And one day I got this phone call and he said, can you be in Cornwall tomorrow? I said, Cornwall? I said, what's that for? He said, I got you a job. I said, you've got me a job. He said, yeah. He said, I got you four episodes of a brand new TV show called Frontier. I didn't even have to audition. He got it on the strength of my showreel. So I go to Cornwall, do um, do some bits there, and then I fly to Newfoundland. And this job was going for about a month. So I was back and forth, back and forth. It was unbelievable. And I was filming on the ship in Cornwall and uh, working with a great actress, um, Catherine. She was Australian, actually, but she'd just come out of RADA. And she'd done a lot of work with Kenneth Branagh. And she was in the Kenneth Branagh film where he played Shakespeare, you know, after he yeah. retires. She yeah. played, I think she played his oldest daughter. Can't remember what her last name is now, but that I think Frontier was one of the first things she'd done out of drama school. Um, so she was great to work with. I had, a, I had a great time. Didn't even have to audition. So Pretty sweet. <laughs> I've got great memories of that gig. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, you done the film a uh, couple of year, years ago, um, I Am Vengeance, uh, Retaliation. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, we mentioned wrestling earlier, Wade Barrett was in it, but uh, the big man Vinnie Jones was on there as well. So uh, have much fun filming that. Well, again, didn't meet him. I played the head of MI5. I do that one scene in that room where there's guns and weapons all yeah. over the place. I worked with a guy called Mark Griffin. Who, uh, who originally was a gladiator, I believe. Broken. Yeah, and I also worked with Stu Bennett, who was great, and some yeah. other some other younger actors as well. And they were all really lovely. But a weird thing happened. Ross Boyask was the director, and he's he's a mate of mine now. And um, and I I'd learned the wrong script, so right. I turned up, and uh, the same crazy woman that I was uh, with in Nottingham. I brought her down to Ipswich where we were filming and I'd got her to run through my lines. And then I suddenly said to her, <coughs> oh, my God, I've learned the wrong script. And she went, oh, no. So we had to spend most of the night learning the correct lines. Wow. Much to her chagrin. And then the next next day I got up, I'd hardly had any sleep. <coughs> I turned up and I, I'm normally really good on the dialogue. I could not remember the lines. But at one point I did remember them was during the close up, which was the most important boy, and I got it I got them fine. Yeah. So um so I made that stressful because I didn't learn the bloody right script. So uh that that was a lesson I I uh I learned. <laughs> Make sure you got the right script. <laughs> sure. Well, David, we're down to the final part of the show. So it's called Prime Time Nine, and uh, it's a bit of a personality test, really. So I'm going to ask you a few uh, topics, and you basically name me your favourite of each one. So start things off. Uh, these are always hard, by the way. So your first one, uh, your favourite movie. Well, I'm going to have to say the first Godfather, because yeah. it's probably the film that I've watched the most. Um, but it's just got the best performances ever from you know Pacino uh Robert Duvall James Kahn Brando followed very closely by Godfather 2 particularly for De Niro's performance and yeah. also a young Bruno Kirby as well so I you know the the god I look at the Godfather 1 and 2 as one film so if we call yeah. that one film I I think it's just perfection cinematic perfection it's followed very closely by streetcar named desire and um on the waterfront because i'm a i'm a massive marlon brando fan and Elia kazan the director I, I thought was amazing but i'd have to say the godfather is probably my favorite great answer uh favorite song my favorite song um probably the song that i played the most when i was a kid was by the buzzcocks and it was called ever fallen in love <laughs> you spurt right. my unnatural emotions and you make me feel I'm dirt and I'm a for some reason that song stays in my mind and also I was into a, a, a punk rock band from Northern Ireland called Stiff Little Fingers and um, that I had their album Inflammable Material so uh, 
uh, the, their song Suspect Device starts off, inflammable materials planted in my head. It's a suspect device. It's left 2,000 dead. So I'd have to say probably Suspect Device is right up there. But there are billions. You know, I'm a big Tom Waits fan. I'm a big Nick Cave fan. <coughs> you know, I mean, I love the Sleaford mods. You know, that TCR, Total Control Racing. I, so my musical taste is quite eclectic these days. But my punk rock roots are still there for all to see. Awesome. Uh, last one. Uh, your favourite... Um, which one was it now? Yeah. Uh, favourite road story? My favourite what? Uh, road story or story on set, your funniest film uh, story on set. <laughs> well, my favourite road story is probably when I toured across America before yeah. I was known, you know. And I <laughs> we went out with this band of renegades uh, from this theatre company called The New Vic. And the guy who ran it was this ex-circus strongman who only had one eye called wow. Mickey O'Donoghue. And, um, and we went from the East Coast, New York, right the way across America. We drove some of it. We flew some of it. But the adventures we had on route on that gig were some of the best times I've ever had. Um, you know, and it lasted, I think the whole gig lasted about three months. I mean, it was extraordinary. So I remember with great, um, you know, uh, great joy, those those times, great affection. <clears throat> so I would say that. And uh, the best story probably is when I did a play um, at the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester. And we were all wearing these capes. Uh, I was doing Serrano de Bergerac. And there's this massive fight scene. <clears throat> and as I ran on stage this night, and this this fight was beautifully staged, and you had to get your timing pinpoint. As I ran in, my cape snagged on a wheelchair. So oh, yeah. I tried to unsnag it, and I nearly pulled the guy in his wheelchair over. Now, the Royal Exchange Theatre is like in a pod. So what I could have done is just ran, run round and come in for the next bit. Instead of which, I ran right right through the fight and wrecked it. <laughs> so I was a legend after that fight in Manchester for wrecking the wrecking it wrecking the fight man. So oh. those, those are the two things that stand out the most for me. Awesome. Well, David, it's an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Before we do go, uh, tell them where they can find you on social media. So I am uh, at the real David Shaw on Instagram. I am at David C Shaw on Twitter. Those are the uh, the two bits of social media that i frequent the most awesome and yeah thanks very much for joining us and yeah uh, we'll try and catch up in six months time and see our weight losses <laughs> yeah well not six months I'll, let's keep in contact i want to i want a monthly report james oh definitely <laughs> that, that 19 pounds is unbelievable <clears throat> so i want to know more about your weight loss oh thank you very much uh, yeah i'll definitely uh, send you my diet plan what i'm doing and uh yeah, we'll, uh, we'll definitely stay in touch. <laughs> All right, my friend. It's been a pleasure seeing you. All right, thank you.